I want to publicly begin by giving extraordinary thanks and praise to Tobias for your brilliance and leadership. The excellence of this documentary is clear to all who've seen it so far, and I think it's going to go far and wide. So thank you to you for all of the extraordinary hard work and again, the brilliance and excellence of this documentary. I will put in the chat for the for everyone the link to the video. It's also in the reminder email that you all received. To get the conversation started, uh, to all three of you, be interested to know when and how did you first learn of this story and what does it mean for you? Um, well, I heard the, hi everyone, I'm Tobias. Um, I heard of the story very briefly from a uh, leader or director of the Gilder Letterman Center of uh, Study of Slavery and Resistance and Abolition, David Blight, and also the leader of Yale and Slavery. Um, David gave me a quick note and just said, you know what the intro is, did you know, right? That's like the, the hook to really, you know, let you know this was a thing. And it's hard to believe that it was such uh, a hidden story. Um, it's almost like history really didn't want uh, to reveal itself, but thank you to the wonderful work of Yale and Slavery and many others for uncovering the story. I later hear about it from Michael and it gives me the full breakdown. We take a walk through uh, Grocery Cemetery, which is right down the street from the Beinecke Library. And that is the place where you literally relive history. That is where people who are involved in the story, they lie there. And um, there's so many names that have faces and a lot of names that don't have faces. Uh, when we took a walk, uh, Michael sort of pointed to some of the stones of people that were involved in the, the denial of this college. And immediately, you know, we both agreed this story has to be brought to life. Um, there's so many stories, so many people being uncovered uh, in New Haven specifically right now. And this story is something that I think will really be a... Uh, a gateway, right, to all the rest of these uh, stories that are being uncovered. And honestly, you know, with everything that was uncovered, it was almost a privilege to work on something like this because honestly, the story told itself, the material told the whole story. And I don't think there were too many missing parts um, to this. So honestly, when you get a chance, definitely click on the link that Michael has provided and, you know, hear the, the story in its entirety, maybe watch it on the television and just fully immerse with the history. Charles. I um, learned about the uh, story of the Negro College idea. Um, initially through uh, conversations around um, at the Dixwell Congregational Church. Uh, the Dixwell Church is the uh, current um, incarnation of the African Ecclesiastical so uh, Society, which became the Temple Street Congregational Church, where many of the uh, early church leaders and founders were involved, um, living and involved with um, the state of black people um, at that time. And um, I learned more through the Amistad Committee who had um, put some money up to um, finance a, a comprehensive work around the subject. And that's where I really delved into some of the details. Um, I've also had the privilege of, you know, listening to you, Mike, and um, some of the discussions we've had at the Yale and Slavery Working Group. And, you know, it's one thing to have historical information around but you know, this is a calling. Um, this is a, a special um, skill or art that individuals have who are really able to contextualize and, and bring history into focus. And so um, you were definitely one of the people along with um, 
folks like Joy Burns, um, who have made the story even more real for me and more complete for sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I have one. I'm, I'm Alvin. Um, so I came, I came to the story um, through a research um, of the fermenting canal. I was quite interested, um, interested in the fermenting canal and wanted to know like um, its history and then how it became like, you know, this long bike trail that I really enjoyed. And I, in researching to the, the labor that was like, um, and put into the making of the ca canal, I somehow chanced upon the story about a college within that same period that the canal was being built, um, the story of the college. And um, it was also in relation to me wanting to know more about New Haven, because then I, I've, I've lived in New Hallville for um, three years since I've been here in Yale. And I really wanted to know more about New Hovel and New Haven in itself. And um, through that research, I came into the document the Amistad Committee had set up, um, which is on yaleslavery.org. Um, it was a very, um, um, it's, it's a very good resource like to get into um, having a better understanding um, of um, the, the college itself. And then from that, I think I met Michael, um, and he asked about it and I'm like, oh, I'm actually even researching it. And we spoke and um, one thing led to the other, came to have further discussions with Tobias and um, yeah, and materialized into this project, which we are um, having a discussion about today. Thank you, all three. It's been said that history may not repeat, but it does rhyme or perhaps we can think that stories from the past have resonance in the present. I wonder if each of you could reflect on why for you personally, but also for our uh, university, for our New Haven community, for Connecticut, for the nation, why this story and its recovery matters for us now in this time. What do you think it means to us? And what do you hope this documentary will do in sharing that meaning further? Goodbye. I, uh... So I, I think a lot about this. I mean, working with the question, what could have been for months, literally reliving it and watching it over and over again and constantly hearing the question, what could have been? You know, it's like, you can't uh, help but wonder, right? There's, uh, you know, in the Long Wharf area of New Haven, I always think about, that space and the probability of that being another campus, right? Like I look at the story and I see this was supposed to be right where I-95 and I-91 were. At the end of the documentary, I give a sort of a pan of that general area. There's like a empty parking lot. There's um, highways just crossing over it. And that space isn't as important. People pass by it, right? It's not of any importance. There's no monuments there, but there is. And when I ask myself what could have been, I think of the good and the bad. I think of if this college were passed, I immediately think of what could have went wrong because of the immediate aftermath and people showing their true colors during the voting of this. Not only the people who voted on it, but the people who wrote papers on it, right? All the uh, Southern newspapers that come out uh, applauding everyone, right? There's riots happening. There's uh, people applauding as if the nation just got its independence with the Declaration of Independence. And now you have the college being dismissed. Now, if that college wasn't dismissed and it was put right there where Dwight's gymnasium was, who's to say that wouldn't be immediately attacked? Who's to say that wouldn't be torched through all the riots, right? And, and run the black people out of town. You can't hope but think of that stuff. But on the opposite side, I think of, well, in the long run of all of that, 
pass all the riots, pass all of the uh, public hatred that will come out of a college being next to Yale, I think there could have been, I feel like New Haven could have been even bigger than it was over time. Like right now we look at New Haven as this small uh, city, but also has uh, a lot of sort of access to the uh, huge population, people coming from New York and all up north coming to Connecticut and New Haven. I think of if this college was built, there could have been some type of harmony there between the Yale campus and the, the black campus right there, just off kiltered a bit from the, from the town square. People's worry through all of this and why it was a resounding 700 to four, they were worried they would lose their prosperity. Connecticut was one of the largest uh, towns, right? Yale had the highest matriculation rate. Uh, New Haven had access to trade. It was a Mecca in a, in a sense uh, during that time. And if additional races were allowed to be a part of that. Who knows how much bigger New Haven might have been, uh, how much more well known it would be through the nation. And I'm just looking past all the riots because I can't help but think, right, there would be a lot of bad stuff, but past that. If it was to be established, they would have no choice but to collaborate, right? They'd have no choice but to accept it over time and who's to say, you know, that wouldn't be as prosperous as Yale, you know? And there's a, there's a quote at the end that says, um, one of the newspaper clippings, it, it, there's an analogy comparing blacks uh, to bees swarming in a hive. That viewpoint immediately shifted everyone's mentality. It's like, if you have all this prosperity in New Haven, you can't have a bunch of black people there that will ruin it, right? That was the immediate connotation that came with opening a school of just colored people. However, they're forgetting that, I mean, what do we have? I think there's seven years later and uh, the, the first black school is established, right? And you're, I'm sitting here thinking, Wow, it took that denial. I feel like, I feel like that denial as vastly covered as it was in the news, that denial ultimately led to the eventual prosperity and creation of uh, multiple HBCUs that were to come. And this was such a necessary trial and error. It was one of those things where we had to see where the nation was with this idea. The nation resoundingly said, no, this is not what we want. And white supremacy became very apparent in that moment. But guess what? Less than a decade, the first one does open up and you have, yes, there's backlash to it, but it still happened and now it still exists and now it's prospering. That could have been the case if that was passed. So I look at New Haven and I'm disappointed, but I'm also hopeful in a sense. And I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about future uh, what ifs later, but um, I, I truly think that if that college was put there, there would be so much more uh, notoriety that would come with New Haven uh, good and bad, right? But that's a necessary thing um, in order for it to prosper later on. Charles, you've been a leader. Thank you, Tobias. Charles, you're a leader in telling stories at the Freedom Trail and the Amistad Committee and, and Dixwell Church. Um, what do you hope that this documentary that Tobias has led will do in uh, sharing this story? And, and why do you think this story matters uh, in our present time? Uh, what I hope it will do is give a true picture 
of what um, African American life was was truly like at that time. Um, historically, Black people tend to be depicted as um, victims, um, as background characters, um, as nameless, faceless um, filler to to a um, story of a developing nation. But clearly, um, these these Black people who were definitely involved with looking to better themselves and and really participate in what the nation said that it was offering citizens of America. Um, I think one of the things that we we don't talk about is the participation of um, African Americans in the Revolutionary War. And some of these these folks who are involved with Simeon Jocelyn and and his work with um, bettering the black community and um, one of those things obviously being education. A lot of those folks were, were children of people who um, had been involved in the Revolutionary War who felt like the promise of freedom and full citizenship rights were theirs. And so I hope that this really tells about the contribution, the long contribution of African Americans in the country, but also that we use it um, as a way to really put into context what we're living through now. Um, with a obvious um, strong and concerted effort to erase people uh, from history and to rewrite history and to um, revisit <laughs> some of those um, old struggles and fights. Um, and so really, I hope folks are inspired by this and it, it really presses them to get involved uh, with the current issues around education and voting rights and full, citizen, uh, full citizenship rights that African-Americans are dealing with today. Um, hopefully this um, is a inspiration and a roadmap. Thank you, Alvin. You've been in New York for three years and also bring a perspective from outside this country. What do you, why do you think this story matters and what do you hope the documentary might do? Um, so I personally hope it it starts um, it starts further conversation um, with regards to the history um, of New Haven and even how New Haven um, like the existing structure of New Haven at the moment um, the um, at the the states of New Haven with with regards to like you know work done by um, your respect to New Haven. And, and such organizations. I'm basically hoping that this documentary would, um, would uh, in as much as it being, um, starting all those conversations would also be like um, an archival document for even um, young New Haven kids to even look back at, and then also learn from like, you know, what has been, like what happened in the past and what, the future can be like you know what what shouldn't be like you know repeated again in in the future. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, to to jump off from that, uh, Charles and, and Tobias, you both went to high school in New Haven. I wonder if you could reflect on what your hopes are, what you think should be done, what we all should be doing in terms of education, K twelve, perhaps particularly in high school and. Uh, ways that you think this documentary might uh, be able to be a tool for for uh, helping in that teaching? Well, um, I, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Tobias. No, please do. No. <laughs> um, I, I'm thinking, Mike, that certainly uh, we're living through a special time in the state where the legislature has mandated that um, African American and Latino studies will be. Um, included in the history curriculums throughout the state. So, um, you know, these high school students have the opportunity to learn um, fully that, um, you know, the real position that they're in being the inheritors of this hard work and that so many people struggled and, and fought and not in a wide kind of abstract way, but literally on the land that they're standing on. So what I hope is that um, they're really inspired to um, shoot for the shoot for the stars and go as high as they can, and but also press um, the government for for full, fully what they're owed, 
and um, maybe even to really lead a reckoning for a lot of the past wrongs and, and um, really push for and receive a lot of the repair um, that really needs to be done. Um, the idea, the, uh, Michael and a few others told me this, um, serious, half serious, I don't know. There's this idea that there should still be clothing, right? There should still be college merch for something like this. Um, I love, I love that idea because of the fact that it makes it real at that point. People have to ask, oh, I, I've never seen that college in New Haven. I've never even heard of that. What is that, right? It doesn't even have a real name. Like, what is this? That would be amazing because to see people walking around the place where it was denied to then have it brought back is almost uh, fulfilling in a sense. But also there's this, you know, there's this need to, to you know, continue uncovering a lot of stories which are happening now with Yale and slavery and many other archival groups, right? You have people like Jacob Ossin, Bias Stanley, William Lamson, Maria Miller Stewart, um, stories that most people have not heard of, but they are so important to Yale's, I mean, not Yale, New Haven's foundation. And I think it's important, you know, with, students uh, sort of having more liberties these days, I guess, to explore and really understand their history, this is the perfect opportunity to, uh, to start looking, right? This story is like a base. 1831 is telling you what it was in the 19th century and how it's come now, right? Yale is still one of the primary Ivy Leagues to uh, apply to, right? When you're coming out of high school, everyone knows the Yales, the Harvards, the Browns, right? Yale back then was still the college, one of the top colleges to go to. And in the midst of that, there was an idea to be formed. It was talked about in Philadelphia, right? It was published in so many newspapers. People were hearing about this. And at the same time, while Yale is continuing to prosper, this story has continued to die in a sense, right? People know about Yale, but if you ask them this, they know nothing about it, which is the goal. We want people to know just as much about this school as they know about Yale. And I think students coming up now, living in New Haven, uh, have the wonderful opportunity to just explore where, where everything happened. I went to a charter school and didn't necessarily get to explore New Haven like that. And uh, I wish I did, but in the same sense, you know, there's, it's never too late to learn history. It's never too late to hear something, pass it on, let that story continue to build. And then it becomes like a, like a Yale, right? Um, so my hope for all this is honestly that people will continue to share this because that's going to start, uh, that's going to start groups, right? That's going to start discussions. That's going to start um, ideas. I mean, obviously the most optimistic goal would be create the college, right? <laughs> but obviously land is a lot different. All, most land is occupied now. It's not that easy, but honestly, on the road to you know, something that can help make that idea real is passing the story on. The more people that know about it, they're gonna ask questions. Why didn't this happen? Why are we still ignoring it? Why is it that no one has tried, you know, with this generation now, everything goes viral, right? And people live for that stuff. That's what starts the conversation. And with everyone continuing to watch this film, it becomes real and it becomes a moment in time that can't be erased anymore. Thank you uh, both for those uh, compelling and bold visions. Uh, Alvin, do uh, you want to jump in and, and thoughts on, on this? 
um, on, on what could have been. So I, I, I definitely, on, on from my perspective, I definitely think um, the, the geography of New Haven would definitely have been so different. Um, the, and like I share Tobias's um, feeling with regards to the fear of like um, what could, um, the repercussions of things that could have happened with regards to seeing the aftermath of um, when Simeon Jocelyn had proposed the, school, um, the college and then it being um, denounced by the citizens. I, 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 I share that fear because I, I feel it, it would have been, because reading through um, all the excerpts I was working on, um, like, you know, in collecting things from the, um, the newspapers, clippings, and then seeing what people were writing and then seeing the, the, the negative energy being pushed just against, like, you know, um, individuals wanting to educate themselves. Um, I, I definitely do share that same fear of like, you know, what would have happened to like, you know, people sending their kids over there, but then also like the, the possibilities of what would have been for like, you know, students who had gone through that educational system outweighs that, that fear in some sense. And I, I know it would definitely would have changed changed and like morphed the, the geography of New Haven and even the the divide, the economic divide that is felt in in, in current times, basically. Yeah. Thank you to everyone for questions in the uh, and, and comments in the chat. By the way, uh, somebody suggested that this should also be the subject of a graphic novel. So Alvin, perhaps you can talk to folks in the design world about that. I wanted to, uh, as we uh, uh, questions and prompts from the audience, a, a question to bias about process, if, if you could just sort of talk a little bit about what you were thinking as, as you put this together, you're showing something that didn't happen. So how did that sort of influence your thinking? And Charles, if you could reflect, you're someone in town who knows this story uh, fairly well, how seeing it in this documentary way, how that uh, uh, changed uh, the way and, and what do you think in terms of this form, what it, what it means for your knowing and, and sharing of the story. But Tobias, if you could talk some uh, about the challenges and opportunities uh, putting a documentary film together from the archives of something that did not happen. Right. Um, I will say the process was very exhausting, um, but, but so worth it. Uh, creating something that never existed, it takes a lot of um, imagination in a sense, right? We're, we're looking at nothing but newspaper clippings, um, a pamphlet that had descriptions of what was going on, and that's what we're building the story on. There's not a lot of go-to images, right? There's, uh, there's a state house that was built during that time that doesn't exist anymore. And luckily we found, you know, illustrations of that, and there's plenty of them shown in the video. Uh, there's not a lot of bird's eye view looks at New Haven, right? You just have maps at the time, obviously. People are drawing and printing maps. They're not necessarily, um, obviously they don't have cameras to, to shoot this stuff, right? So we're basing the setting and the words of the people who delegated this we're doing that all on maps and newspaper clippings. The, I think the hardest thing I had to deal with was making sure the people who didn't have faces were still well known and recognizable in a sense. I went with this theme of black and white because that's the clear division in this narration. You notice subtle things like certain title heads are white based on what they were doing or not doing. Uh, and then actions of black people are in black, right? It's because if you notice in the newspapers, there's a clear division and they make it very apparent um, 
of that division. So I wanted to bring that out. I wanted to bring the theme of racial division into that in simple schemes. I wanted to bring New Haven to life by finding whatever sort of um, prints that I could find of New Haven. Um, and we had a lot of wonderful prints. Um, and I think at this, uh, John Warner Barber was sort of the engraver, one of the main engravers at the time in New Haven. And we have a lot of his printings that he did of New Haven. So that really helped put it in perspective. At that point, it was putting voices to people and making sure that everything had its proper timing. A lot of these things that happen are so traumatizing. It's almost like they need pauses in between. They need, um, they need to be uh, put on the screen for a little bit for people to actually realize what they're hearing. So there's a lot of pauses you'll see. There's a lot of uh, close-ups and highlights to make sure everyone knows who's saying what, when something took place, there's timelines. And for a documentary that you have to rely on just those few things, I think it's better that way because now you're not just relying on visuals. You really have to listen. You have to hear everything that people are writing and saying. Sure, I can show you a newspaper clipping, but if you're just looking at the screen and looking at the clipping, not really hearing anything, you know, that loses its point. So this documentary is a bit complex, but also simplistic in that sense. You have to listen more than watch because the documentary is a recycle, it's recycling a lot of newspaper clippings and it's recycling a lot of New Haven prints. That is to set the setting, but hearing it, I suggest put it on the TV, put headphones on, just listen to it. And then you actually hear the pauses, right? You hear the, oh my gosh, I can't believe that actually happened. You hear the language that people use uh, used in 1831, and you have to really just sit back and think, wow, uh, the fact that this was even a thing is amazing. But since it happened, once you listen and pick up all aspects of the film, it becomes such a revolutionary and well-rounded piece that, I mean, you, you might even want to just listen to it time after time uh, and really understand each person that was involved, each institution that contributed to some sense and how the state, I mean, the nation was so divided. Charles, your reflections on seeing this and, and, and getting it in a documentary form like this? I mean, I, I suppose what it does is really gives a face and a voice to stories that I've been sharing um, for, for a long time. And um, they're stories that um, really gave me a firm foundation to stand on. I left New Haven at 17, uh, going to Morehouse College. Um, and I was going to school with students whose parents were um, Oscar winning actors and captains of industry and you know children of politicians who had gone to you know, the top prep schools um, in, in the country. And, and I never felt uh, unprepared or, or less than. I, I stood just as tall, um, if not in, in certain moments taller, because of um, the shoulders that I stood on. I understood um, that uh, Simeon Jocelyn and, and, you know, William Lanson and Bias Stanley and all those good folks, um, I was the direct inheritor of their work. Um, I grew up going to Dixwell Congregational Church um, and for a long stretch of time, my parents um, were um, the organist and the ministers of music there. And so I spent a lot of, a lot of time in that building uh, when I was young. And, um, you know, these just aren't stories. Um, I, these are almost like um, family memories, um, things that were passed down to, to folks who, who raised me 
who, who who taught me and helped to shape me into being who I am. So it's wonderful to have um, a, a document like this that can uh, be shared and used as an educational tool, but it also helps to really put into perspective the importance of the work of our ancestors um, and the selflessness and the sacrifice um, that these people um, made with their lives to make sure that I can have what I have today. That's powerful. And I think sometimes we take it for granted. Um, we don't understand that we don't exist in these separate uh, moments, th these historical silos. Uh, we are a link in a chain. And for sure, if I may, um, Mike, you asked earlier about um, sort of the effect um, of the Negro college, the destruction of the Negro college idea. You know, what I really think about is folks like, um, you know, New Haven citizens like uh, Sharon Bradford and um, my good childhood friend, Stephen Moore and, and, and my friends, uh, Ian and Jared Pollard, who are um, descendants of people who were living in New Haven at that time. I think back to a conversation, Michael, you and I had with Regina Mason and how, how she cried um, at the discussion of the Negro College idea because her great, great, great grandfather, William Grimes and her great, great grandmother, uh, Clarissa Caesar would have been, you know, people whose lives were enriched by the opportunity of the Negro College. So this is not some, you know, his, old story or old myth or tale. You know, this is um, a very real incident in our um, historical memory, but in our present lives. And, and honestly, I think about my students and how their lives would have been different had um, something like the Negro College um, been established, um, it would have changed the trajectory of their lives. I, you know, I, I lived in Atlanta for a long period of time and, and the city of Atlanta, you know, um, since the late seventies was uh, able to elect African-American mayors um, time after time until the present day um, really because of the influence of having um, six um, institutions of higher learning uh, for African Americans. And so um, I, I think about um, the sort of community raising, the um, actual instruction and how that translates into entrepreneurship and economic development um, and, and cultural life. And so certainly New Haven would be different. And those folks who are living in New Haven now or uh, passed through New Haven from 1831 until uh, 2022 um, would have been different people with different experiences. Thank you. And I'm, I'm cognizant of what Maya said about pauses. And, and I'd like just to pause for a moment so we can all Think about the words that you just spoke, Charles. Thank you for them. And if I may, for the audience also, thank you, Charles, for bringing uh, your parents into this conversation. And as we were talking, it is a true blessing to see your mother, Dr. Regina Warner behind you, and thank you for bringing her into this space uh, this afternoon. Uh, you honor the extraordinary work she did in this community to build a more beloved community. And it really is great to see her with you uh, on this screen in this virtual space today. Well, thanks, Michael. That's, that's really sweet. But if I may, my mom was a, um, you know, her, her terminal degree was from Columbia University, but um, her undergraduate work was done at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and certainly uh, Fisk was, um, I suppose, a, a link in the chain of the Negro College story because, you know, although the Negro College idea was defeated in 1831, that defeat, I think, bolstered um, Simeon Jocelyn and the boys, the crew, um, to fight when, um, 
injustice reared its ugly head again with the Amistad incident. And then it galvanized them to uh, form the American Missionary Association, the Tappan Brothers and, and Simi and Jocelyn. And the American Missionary Association uh, was pivotal with establishing historically black uh, colleges and universities throughout the South. And so, um, although my parents weren't from New Haven, they definitely were beneficiaries of the defeat of the Negro college idea, which in my opinion, bolstered um, this same group of patriots and freedom fighters to um, work very hard to establish the uh, various black colleges in the South following the Civil War. Thank you again, and thank you to all three. As we approach the close, just a quick program note. I've put in the chat notice of three upcoming virtual programs from Beinecke Library. Tomorrow, our colleague, Melissa Barton will be having a program with Native Voices at the Autry in conjunction with the current exhibition, Brava. The next is a, actually a virtual program from the Yale and Slavery Research Project, a student symposium on quote, from slavery to eugenics, confronting legacies of racism in medicine and across the disciplines, which will be online on Wednesday. And then next Monday, in the Mondays at Beinecke series, we'll be revisiting Jethro Luke and race and slavery in 18th century New Haven and Yale and building on work that's being done in the Yale and slavery project. One final prompt for all three of you, but before that, some quotes from audience observations. This panel is terrific. This is an amazing history and documentary. Thank you to the three of you for your fantastic presentation. Many, many compliments for the extraordinary work you've done. Many compliments and thanks for how you have spoken the truth in this time together and how this documentary does it. The final prompt uh, uh, to each of you as we uh, approach the close is a simple one and, and we've touched on it some today and Tobias noted that, quote, the question in the film is what could have been, but inherent in that is also what should be done. So as a final prompt to, to each of you, and maybe Alvin, we'll start with you, Charles and Tobias, uh, closing with you, what should be done? Alvin. Um, I've certainly, Locally, there should be um, a concerted effort to uh, educate, and I do mean a, a much harder effort. There are um, initiatives of all kinds, but we should really focus in on making sure that local New Haven youth are prepared for higher education and have the opportunity regardless um, of um, finances. Um, I, I'm going to actually put some of this squarely on the shoulders of Yale University, um, who really um, was at the, um, you know, I suppose at the center of defeating the Negro College idea. Um, I think that they should be called upon to help rectify some of the um, educational injustice of today, and and not in a kind of far off, far away. Um, way, but in a close New Haven students from the city way. Thank you, Alvin. Yeah, um, so I've personally been thinking about um, what this project, like the nodes of researching into this project could lead to, like what, what would be, like um, what definitely is the, what else is hidden? that can be found through traversing the story and the discussions that can be, that is being having now and then could be, um, that would be, um, would happen around um, this documentary in the future. And then possibly like, um, what else can it on air? Uh, um, and um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm just basically been been thinking about that, like um, what the the documents we've been able to come together with, um, the possibilities of it leading to different parts and then different um, conversations in that sense, and then on adding new um, new or even things that had been shoved away in the past. Um, but yeah. Before the final word uh, to you, Tobias, I, I put again in the chat the link for the film. Encourage everyone to watch it, rewatch it, follow Tobias's advice about watching it on a big screen with headphones, and most importantly, share it. We hope that this will be a generative documentary and build on the conversations that have been going on that Charles have noted over the years, more in recent times and going forward. That this will be a story that generates much thinking and action. I know that art space in an exhibition upcoming that begins on April 30th will have an artist who's uh, responding to the 1831 college. Very excited about that and uh, make sure to check out art space. And hopefully there will be many more. There's the local high school, MBA high school, and Natalia Berginsky and her students have done a marvelous walking tour that tells many stories, including this story. And so it's really great to see many, 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 many ways of telling this story growing and hopefully that will continue. I'm certain that this documentary will help uh, uh, propel that further. And again, Tobias, to you, thank you for the excellence and brilliance of this work to the team you put together, including Charles and Alvin. And final word to you, Tobias, uh, what should be done? You know, I think about plausible options here. The first one being a, a memorial, a sign, uh, something that shows recognition. This was here. This was supposed to be here, right? We say in the documentary countless amounts of times. This was supposed to be on the intersection of I-91 and I-95. Why not have a sign there right underneath that I-91? You know, and uh, you know, on highways, right? There's signs that give uh, historical landmarks, right? That give, uh, right, homage to things that once were, or maybe things that are and have lasted for so many decades. But also, this could lead to so many different teaching avenues, and I think this is something that should be a regular thing in New Haven that should be taught, uh, even if it's not a course, right? This should be something on the syllabus to look forward to. Right now, it can be used in shows. It should be used in exhibitions. It should be put out there to the point where people can't not see it. And, you know, last but not least, with this documentary, I am glad to already see that, you know, a thousand plus people are educated. They know the story. They're willing to pass that on. That is great in itself. And I am hopeful and I'll continue to pray that this is something that will make it into bigger, brighter lights because the story itself tells what New Haven once was, but it also leaves it up for interpretation for what it can be. <laughs>